last week on, on uh, being a good servant of God. We talked in that study about many elements of being a good servant of God. Now in this, in this study, I want to follow it up by sharing with you some good examples. You know, sometimes we hear things in precept, uh, you know, step one, step two, step three, this is what we need to be about, this is what we need to be doing. But if you're like me, I, it, it helps in my learning, in my growing, to see an example of what it is that we've been talking about. It really helps me to understand it a little bit more clearly. So that's uh, what I'm hoping to give to you this morning. How many of you like football season? If you do, just raise your hand a little bit. A couple of you, okay, three, four, good. <laughs> of course, you know if you're a football fan that the season is, is close to being over. I've, I've never been a huge watcher of football games myself. Statistics say that most people watch at least one game a year. So even though football seems to be a big deal, and it is a big deal in our country, uh, it, it's not a big deal with everybody. But I, uh, of course, I've become a lot less enthusiastic the last couple of years with all the politically charged stuff that is going on with football. I would just soon, if I'm going to watch a game, turn it on and watch it and watch it and let that be my escape from all the stuff that is going on. You can get that anywhere. I just when I watch a football game, I just want to watch a football game. That's it. Now, if you're a follower of a particular team like the Seahawks, uh, you know, we're from Cleelum, Washington. It's about an hour and a half from Seattle, so a lot of Seahawks fans there. That some people call them Sea Squawks. Or maybe, you know, I remember when we lived here in Billings for 10 years, a lot of people were Denver Bronco fans. So any Denver Bronco fans here? No. Seahawks fans? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> wow. But, you know, if you're a fall, whoever your team is, you could probably name several of their star players. You know, the ones who seem to be able to make those tremendous plays uh, with what seems like a little effort. Of course, there, there's a lot of effort that goes into it, but when you watch them do it, it just seems like it comes so easy to them. I especially appreciate seeing those long passes with the receiver, you know, running full speed down the field to the goal with his back to the, the quarterback who's going to be passing the ball to him. And of course, he's looking back every now and then to get his bearings. But I just love it when, you know, in that split second, he's, he's going and, and he reaches his hands out. The quarterback is back there and he reaches his hands out and the ball just drops right into his hands. I actually did that one time when I was playing football. It was a miracle. <laughs> Now, again, if you follow your team regularly, you're probably familiar with those great players. They get a lot of a print, a lot of coverage when you see the little, you know, summaries of the games. Those are the guys that are showing up in those, those summaries. Um, they sell a lot of jerseys with their names on them. A lot of those bobbleheads, you know, that you put, you know, in various places in your car or wherever. But you know, there are, are another group of football players who are generally less well known. They are the, the gunners who race down the field when the ball is kicked off, hoping to, to get close enough to the kick or to the, to the punt returner to tackle them before they gain any yards, the gunners. And then there's the holder, the guy who catches the football when it's snapped by by the long snapper. That's the, the guy that you know, we usually consider him the center. But he's not the center in that particular play. He's called the long snapper. The long snapper has to snap the ball long distances with accuracy 
And the holder has to be able to catch the ball and put it in position so that the punter or the field goal kicker um, can kick the ball with accuracy. These guys are generally lesser known than the star players. Now why is that? Well, because they are what are called special teams players. Special teams. Generally they're not on the field much. Usually only for kickoffs and, and for punts. They, they come on the field to do their job and then they just as quickly leave the field. They have a special task to perform. That's their job. Kind of like pinch hitters or pinch runners in baseball. They have a special job to do and they come on the field, they do it, and then they just as quickly are gone. So, so they're called special teams players. They usually don't get the notoriety that the uh, regular offensive and defensive players uh, get. But, but here's a fact, and it's a very important one. You cannot have a Super Bowl caliber football team if you don't have good special teams players. I'm talking about guys who will sacrifice their bodies to run down the field at full speed to stop a punt or to, to stop a, a kickoff or return. I'm talking about the guys in baseball, you know, who the, the, particularly the infielders, uh, outfielders too, but you know, the ball is hit to them and it's sort of out of their reach. You know, it's, 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 and these guys will dive. Have you ever seen them before? They, whether it's shortstop or first base or whoever, they'll dive and their bodies will go parallel to the ground and they're reaching just to get that ball. They're risking, <laughs> seems like life and limb. I don't know how they get up after they do that. Seems like, you know, they'd be all skinned up and everything. And probably they are. But these are guys that, that sacrifice significantly in order to uh, contribute to the team. Now, special teams players are, again, one of the keys to a successful football team. And they're also, I think, one of the keys to a successful ministry. As Paul closes out this letter to the Colossians, in these verses that we read earlier, he mentions 10 men who uh, really are not mentioned uh, very much in the Bible. Ten, 10 men who were his special teams players, so to speak. In fact, uh, for at least two, this is the only reference that we have to these guys in the Bible. But these were guys who, for the most part, made an impact on the world around them. Now we're gonna consider these guys today under um, five headings. First of all, the faithful, then the fervent, the faltering, the fickle, and finally the forgiven. F five Fs there, I don't normally do that, but um, it, it seemed to work, so. Faithful, fervent, faltering, fickle, and forgiven. Consider each of these guys today and their impact on the body of Christ, and then how they, they provide for us examples for uh, being servants of God, being faithful servants. So let's first look at the faithful. First up is a fellow by the name of Tychicus, who was, who was the man with a servant's heart. Look at verse seven through nine with me. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. So Tychicus, it means uh, fortuitous or fortunate. He ministered with Paul for many, many years. He's mentioned five times in the New Testament, starting in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 20. Paul is in Ephesus near the end of his third missionary trip. His plan was to return to Jerusalem, 
via Macedonia where he would then uh, pick up the collection that the Gentile churches had put together for the persecuted Jewish believers in the church in Jerusalem. And Paul wanted to deliver this offering. They had collected the money and Paul wanted to be a part of the group that uh, delivered the offering, but he also wanted some of the Gentile believers from these churches that had uh, collected the money, he wanted them to come with him. And Tychicus was one of those Gentile believers. Now this was not an easy journey. I'm talking about traveling from Ephesus to Jerusalem. Today it would be a relatively easy journey. You could hop on a plane in Ephesus, you could fly down to Jerusalem for lunch and a visit with the saints, and you could be back in time for dinner. Not so in Paul's day. This was a long, long, difficult trip. It would be mostly on foot with some sketchy boat trips in between. It would be weeks of hard and dangerous travel. So for Tychicus to undertake this trip was a huge commitment. Plus, almost every stop along the way, people were warning Paul about what would happen to him once he got to Jerusalem. And the warnings weren't good. They were basically saying that he was gonna be persecuted intensely. Agabus, the prophet, came to Paul and he tied himself up and said, Paul, this is what they're gonna do to you once you hit the city. They're gonna tie you up, they're gonna take you prisoner and so forth. So, so there was this dark cloud that was sort of hanging over the whole adventure. The, the cloud turned into a full-blown storm once they actually got to Jerusalem. The end result was that Paul was indeed arrested. He was taken to Caesarea to be tried. He, he stayed there in jail for two years, and then he eventually was sent to Rome, which was another long and dangerous journey. And Tychicus stayed with Paul that whole time, though his release from prison was, you know, not for two years. I mean, he was there for two years. Two years in in Caesarea, also two years in Rome. So this was a very faithful friend. He stuck with him. In 2 Corinthians uh, 11, Paul wrote these words describing his journeys. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, I think it'll be up here on the screen. Three times, he says, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. So far he's not having a good day, right? A night and a day, he says, I have been in the deep, that means in the water, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Now these were, these were some of the things that Paul experienced while ministering for Jesus. What we need to consider, I think, is that Tychicus could have written these same words because he was with Paul. It's likely that Tychicus was right there by his side as he went through those things. Someone once said that the greatest ability in the entire world is availability. I, I like that. I think that's what Tychicus was. He was available. He was available to Paul at all times for all things, including, including the tough things. And most of the things Tychicus did for Paul, I'm sure, were not big things or even noticeable things. But Paul couldn't have done what he did without him. He needed a guy like Tychicus. The last recorded thing that Tychicus did for Paul was to take this epistle, the epistle to the Colossians, and the epistle to Philemon, and the epistle to Ephesians, and to deliver them to their destinations. Three, three letters. So Tychicus was a first century mailman in this circumstance. He was delivering the mail. Now again, we could, we could hear that and think that that's really a nice thing, but no big deal. But to get from Rome 
to Colossae, Tychicus had to cross Italy on foot, then he had to sail across the Adriatic Sea, then he had to traverse Greece on foot, then he had to sail across the Aegean Sea to the coast of Asia Minor where he still faced a journey of almost 100 miles on foot in order to get to Colossae. Now you might not be able to talk someone into doing that today for a lot of money, like a million dollars. People wouldn't do it for a million dollars. I probably would, but <laughs> just for the adventure. Well, maybe it would be better to sit up. I'm, I might have been willing to do it when I was 40, but probably not now. And yet Tychicus did it because of his love for Paul and his love for the church and his love for God. Now, in the scope of the overall ministry of the church, it seemed like a little thing. But think about this. Think about this. The letters that Tychicus delivered outlasted the Roman Empire. They outlasted even the churches that they were delivered to. And they have made it all the way to us here where they remain a blessing to this day. And they certainly have been a great blessing for the last 1900 years to probably billions of people. The life of Tychicus teaches us that there is greatness in the small things that are done for Jesus. Do not despise the days of little things. Those little things could ultimately have a huge impact. You may never know, but they could have a huge, huge impact. Did Tychicus have any idea that, that what he was doing way back then would be touching lives today? No, of course not. But he was faithful. He is mentioned as part of uh, one of Paul's special team players. And Paul refers to him as a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant, one who was able to comfort their hearts. Did you know that the chief virtue of a believer is faithfulness? That, that's, that's really the chief virtue faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 4 2, Paul says, now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. God doesn't ask us to be brilliant or beautiful or well-dressed, but he longs for us to be faithful. You can be a Tychicus, a, a beloved brother or sister, a faithful minister, a faithful servant. Just love your spiritual leaders. Love your pastor and, and support them. Love the body that you're a part of. Love those in the church. Be faithful in the little things. And you will be a Christian along the lines of Tychicus. Next up is Aristarchus, a man with a sympathetic heart. Look at verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of uh, Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Let's focus on Aristarchus here for just a minute. Aristarchus, we're told in verse 11, was a Jewish believer. Though, uh, like many Jews of the diaspora, he had a Greek name. According to Acts 20, verse 4, he was a native of Thessalonica. Aristarchus first appeared during Paul's three-year ministry in Ephesus. He was seized by the rioting mob who recognized him as one of Paul's companions. You can read about this in Acts chapter 19. He accompanied Paul on his return trip to Jerusalem and on his voyage to Rome. And as Paul writes Colossians, Aristarchus is still there with him. He's still beside the apostle. He was actually in prison with Paul. He was in prison with Paul. Probably not for crimes that he had committed, but just because he wanted to be close to minister to Paul's needs. That, that he chose to make Paul's lifestyle his own speaks, I think, of his sympathetic, caring heart. 
He gave up his freedom to minister to Paul's needs. Can you imagine doing that? Somebody you know and love uh, ends up going to jail for whatever reason. And you, you say, you, you go to the, to the warden or to the jail keeper, you know, whoever's in charge, and you say, I, I would like to stay with him in his cell or her in her cell while they're there. I, I you know, I, I want to be there to encourage them. Really? They would think you're nuts. But wouldn't that be cool? I mean, if you found yourself in a situation like that, especially Paul, you know, he was accused of something that he didn't do. And there, there was Aristarchus right beside him. He gave up his own freedom to minister to Paul. Any leader would be enriched to have a faithful Aristarchus at his side through all of his trials. The Lord's work would not be done if it were not for people like Aristarchus. People who are just called alongside to help, who humbly bear hardships without the the, the fame of those that they serve. Galatians 6 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what people like Aristarchus and Tychicus are all about. As they served Paul, they were serving the Lord. That was, that was Aristarchus, special teams player. Next up is Jesus, also called Justice. The man we call, we, we consider with the strong commitment. Look at verse 11. And Jesus, who is called Justice, you understand that's not Jesus the Messiah, but a, another fellow named Jesus, it was a common name. Jesus, who was called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. So nothing is known of, of this Jesus who is called Justice apart from this verse. But according to this verse, Justice, Mark, and Aristarchus were the only um, workers that Paul had who were Jews. That, that's what it means when it says they were part of the circumcision. They were the only ones who were Jews. These, I think, were probably among the first Jews for Jesus. Of course, the, the whole church in Jerusalem was a Jews for Jesus kind of a church, right? But, but the lack of response from his fellow Jews must have really grieved Paul's heart. The Jewish leaders in Jerusalem rejected his message. They plotted to kill him. They denounced him to the Roman authorities. They eventually took him uh, you know, captive as a prisoner and sent him to Caesarea and then on to Rome some years later. But, but they really wanted him dead. That, that's what they wanted to do to Paul. Much of the opposition he received on his missionary journeys was from his fellow countrymen, the Jews. But these guys were the exception. These guys stayed the course. The fact that Jesus' justice was willing to leave his people to identify with Paul, I think demonstrates his strong commitment. He even changed his name from a Jewish name, which was Jesus, to a Roman name, Justice, so that he could gain greater acceptance among the Romans. He was willing to take a stand alongside Paul for Jesus Christ, no matter what the cost. We learn from Justice what an encouragement it can be to just be there with somebody else. You don't have to really do anything. There is no mention of any mighty things that he did, any great sermons that he preached or, or people that he may have led to Christ. He was just there. He was around. He showed up. His presence was a comfort to Paul. We can be that to others as well. Next on the list uh, of the faithful after justice is Luke. Luke, the man we we would consider with the specialized talent. Look at verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician. The beloved physician, I like that. Paul says right off the bat, here's a guy I really love. You know, have you ever heard your name mentioned on somebody else's lips? And that's what they say about you. <laughs> here's, here's 
you know, my wife, Debbie, who I really love. Now, of course, you expect me to say that about my wife, and, but I really do love her. <laughs> but let's just say it's a friend or somebody, you know, maybe that you know a little bit, but not a lot. And you introduce them as this person who you love, your beloved. That, that does something inside your heart if you're the one being talked about, doesn't it? But, but Paul didn't just say that sort of thing for no reason. He said it because he meant it. And, and Luke, Luke was somebody who had a, a, a close, I think, a close relationship with Paul. He was, I, I would say, Paul's personal physician as well as his close friend. You know how it is, you know, when you go in and you see your doctor. You know, you're talking to your doctor about all kinds of stuff you, that you wouldn't talk to anybody else about, right? I mean, you, personal stuff. You, you're not going to sit down, you know, at a, at a uh, dinner, uh, you know, a potluck, uh, see, say here at the church, and talk about the things that you talk to your doctor about. Most people are not going to do that. If, I, if, if they do that, then others will look at them and say, hmm, interesting. <laughs> But Paul, Paul, Luke was Paul's physician. He was his doctor. Uh, and, and because I think he was his doctor and had that close personal relationship with him, he became a personal friend. He, he was a Gentile believer who had traveled frequently with Paul on his missionary voyages. In fact, uh, it, 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 was, it may have been Paul's recurring illnesses on his first missionary journey that prompted him to take Luke along with him in the first place. You know, I kind of, uh, you know, this guy knows a little bit about medicine. Uh, you know, back in those days, doctors didn't know nearly as much, right, as they do now. So I could say that now. Back in those days, Luke, I'm sure, was well educated for his time. But Paul said, hey, you know, I haven't been feeling well. It'd be nice to have a doctor along on the journey. And plus that, others, you know, are going to maybe not feel well at some point. So he, he brought him along. And, and like Paul, Luke was, was well-educated. He was cultured uh, as evidenced by the, I think, the literary quality of his Greek in the gospel that he wrote and also in the book of Acts. He used his specialized talent not for his own gain, but for the furtherance of the gospel. That, that, that is something, I think, to be admired. He was a doctor, and so he could have, you know, made a, a good living from being a doctor. He was well-educated. He could have been a, a, a professor, an educator of some sort. But instead, he used the specialized talents that he had for the furtherance of the gospel. Uh, again, I, I admire that. He, he could have used his training and his skills for his own gain, but he didn't. I'm sure that Luke helped to take care of Paul when he received the many beatings that he received, the floggings, and when he suffered the various ailments during his imprisonments. He was well-educated, highly trained. He was a careful and very exact historian. Yet he chose to use his gifts for the kingdom of God because everything else in his mind, no doubt, was secondary to serving Christ. We know that according to 2 Timothy 4.11, Luke stayed with Paul right up until his death when Paul wrote, only Luke is with me. Only a faithful friend will stay to the very end. Luke teaches us that, that God has given each of us gifts and talents and abilities that go beyond taking care of our personal and physical needs. He teaches us that we need to use these gifts to, to be others-oriented and that we need to be faithful even when the cost is high to us personally. Luke was that man for Paul. Last on the list is, of the faithful is this fellow named Nymphus. The man with the gift of hospitality. Look at verse 15. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church that is in his house. Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So Nymphus was a man with the gift of hospitality. 
He's a person, really, again, not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. This is it. This is the only mention that we have of him. So, so Paul's fifth friend demonstrated his faithfulness by turning his home into a church. He's mentioned simply because he allowed a Bible study to take place in his house on a regular basis. Now that should be a great encouragement to those who host church activities um, in their homes. All this guy did is open up his house and, and he gets his name mentioned in the Bible. He's considered one of the faithful ones. Let's face it, opening up your home to others on a regular basis can be a lot of work, but it is also something that can be a great blessing. Back in those days, it was an essential ministry. For the most part, local churches didn't have buildings like this one. Probably the cost was prohibitive and, and also the persecution was great. Uh, so it made them kind of a target. You know, if, you, if everybody mended a building like this one where you know, the, the surrounding neighborhood hated you, <laughs> then you sort of become a target, right? So, so they, they, they would meet in private homes for the most part. It was of necessity. And so the gift of hospitality was uh, really, really important for these believers. Apparently, Nymphus was one of these faithful servants who gave the use of his house to the believers in Colossae over a long period of time. Okay, so that's the list of the faithful. Let's look next at the fervent. We have just one person on this list, but he's a big one. He's a big one. His name is Epaphras, the man with a devoted passion. Look at verse 12. Epaphras who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. So his name is Epaphras, the man with the devoted passion. We were first introduced to him uh, in chapter 1. Let's turn over to chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, if you would. Hold your place there for a minute. Uh, let's look at verse 7. It says there, As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. So on the basis of that verse, we could have included him in the list of the faithful. Right? Because he's called a faithful minister of Christ. But we didn't. And I'll show you why in a minute. There are several things in chapter 1 and in chapter 4 that stand out to me about Epaphras. First, Epaphras gave a good report concerning the Colossians. We see that back there in chapter 1, verse 7. He told Paul and his companions about the Colossians' love in the Spirit. I'm not sure exactly what this meant, but it, it, it's clear that it's a good thing. Love in the Spirit. I like this about Epaphras. He goes around speaking good things about others. So many people go around speaking bad things about others. But he's not that way. He says, I have good news about the great things happening with those guys in Colossae. I don't know about you, but I want to be like Epaphras in that regard. I want to talk about how great someone is behind his or her back. Because not only does that please the Lord, but it has an impact on me as well. How is that? Well, our words are powerful. You say something about someone to someone else, and it affects their outlook about that person. Epaphras gave a good report. Now, although there were problems going on in the church of Colossae, it certainly wasn't a perfect place, and there was nobody in the church that was perfect. Yet he took time out to highlight the good. He emphasized the good. Let's be sure we do that as well. Second, Epaphras is called a dear fellow servant, also in Colossians 1.7. The word for servant in the Greek is doulos, which means bond servant. A bond servant was a Hebrew 
who had originally sold himself into slavery, but who when it was time for him to be freed, seven years after that, he decided to submit himself to slavery for the rest of his life because his master was good to him and he wanted to continue serving him. Epaphras was a bond servant to Jesus, but he was also a bond servant to the church in Colossae. As you remember, the church was dealing with a bunch of false teachers, but Epaphras didn't bail. He, he submitted himself to serving this less than perfect church. But notice Paul refers to him as a dear fellow servant. I suggest to you that the reason that Paul referred to him in this way was because his attitude was refreshing. He wasn't just a, a fellow servant, but he was a dear fellow servant. He was a refreshing sort of a person. His, his heart was encouraging. He was a man who just loved to serve the Lord. Paul could see it. Others could see it. And so by observing Epaphras and his selfless service, others were refreshed and encouraged to follow his example. Third, Epaphras is called a faithful minister of Christ, also in chapter 1, verse 7. He was a faithful minister. He was faithful to the church, and he served them lovingly. He was dependable. He was available. He was trustworthy to God and man. He had a, he had a passionate devotion for the body of believers at Colossae. You know, er every church needs a lot of people like Epaphras. I hope all of you are of that caliber regarding this particular church. Moving, moving back to chapter 4, Paul highlights what was one of his main ministries. Look at verse 12 again. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. What was his main ministry? He was a prayer warrior. That's the thing that, he, that Paul mentions. Always laboring fervently. In the Greek it means that he agonized in prayer. It's used in 1 Corinthians 9.25 to speak of the grueling competition that was endured by athletes in, in the games. In John 18.36 it's translated fight. Related words appear in Romans 15.30 to speak of fighting in prayer. Uh, Luke 22.44, it's used in reference to Jesus' agony in the garden of Gethsemane. Epaphras was a living example of Paul's command to the Colossians in verse 2 to devote yourselves to prayer. The goal of Epaphras' prayers was that the Colossians would stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, verse 12 again. Perfect means mature or fully developed. Complete means filled up. In other words, that they would be all that God desired them to be. Paul can personally vouch for his hard work in prayer as he not only intercedes for the Colossians, but he's also interceding for the believers in the churches of Laodicea and Hierapolis. Friends, prayer is hard work. Prayer that costs nothing probably uh, isn't really worth anything. He didn't pray only when it was convenient, when he had nothing else to do. Of the ten people that Paul lists in this chapter, only, only Epaphras is commended for his fervency in prayer. That doesn't mean that the others didn't pray, but it, it does suggest that prayer was his major interest in ministry and that he excelled in that ministry. Some of you here this morning are discovering that your primary ministry is prayer. It's not a small thing. It's a big deal. May God bless you. And may God increase your tribe. May he make more like you people who are fervent and faithful in prayer. Keep on doing what you're called to do. Let's look next at the faltering, the faltering. Archippus, the man in need of encouragement. He is also mentioned in Philemon verse 12 as a fellow soldier of Christ. Look at verse 17. And say to Archippus, 
Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. So here Paul takes a minute to encourage Archippus to be faithful to his calling. A number of us are faithful. A few of us are fervent. Some of us are faltering. This was apparently the case with Archippus in verse 17. Faltering. Now again, here's another name you don't hear very often. When, when we compare this verse with Philemon 2, we conclude that Archippus belonged to the family of Philemon. Some commentators suggest that he was also the pastor of the Colossian church in the absence of Epiphras. For some reason, Archippus was neglecting the ministry that he had been given, and so Paul reminds him to fulfill it. The, the phrase means to fulfill it completely. Archippus may have needed special encouragement to keep at it. Perhaps he was sliding spiritually, feeling tired, or, or simply had lost his focus. Maybe he'd, he had given a lot, or, or maybe he had given a little, or a lot, you know, and, and got discouraged in the process because of what seemed like a lack of progress, maybe in his own life, or maybe in the lives of the people of the church. And so he was discouraged. You know, sometimes we need to be challenged to follow through on what we've committed to do. Other times we need a nudge, a little push to get more involved in discerning what uh, ministry that the Lord has for us. So I ask you, are you faltering now? Are any of you faltering? Have you not been, been uh, laying it out for Christ like you were at the beginning? When you first became a Christian, when you first started serving the Lord, you were on fire, you were excited. But it's not that way anymore. There's a faltering that is taking place. If that's the case, then make a renewed commitment to complete the work that God has given you to do. Take heed to the ministry which you have received from the Lord that you may fulfill it. That's an encouragement I think that we all need to hear from time to time. Certainly, I have needed to hear it many times over the years. Next, we consider the fickle, the fickle. Demas, the man with the sad future, verse 14 again. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas, greet you. Demas is sort of the stain, I think, on the group. And I'll explain to you in a minute. It doesn't really tell us that here, but if you check out the rest of Scripture, you'll find out. We can't really tell much about his inconsistencies here. But it's interesting that Paul gives no commendation about Demas and just simply says that he sends greetings. It's like Paul is saying, oh yeah, and Demas says, what's up? You know, kind of the way we are sometimes. In Philemon 24, he's called a fellow laborer. He was from Thessalonica. He was part of, of the original band of Asian interns uh, who traveled with Paul. So, you know, he had a ministry alongside Paul. And, but here in, in Colossians 4.14, he's just called Demas. Perhaps Paul is beginning to see the seeds of his fickle faith at this point as he notices the beginnings of the disease that we might call spiritual drift. 2 Timothy 4.10, written about five years later, tells us what became of him. Paul says there, For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone on to Thessalonica. A spiritual weakness, a fatal flaw, led to his downfall. His sin was that he was more in love with this world than with the one who made the world. We don't really know what happened, but, but we can all recognize how it can happen. First John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. We all have within us I think, the seeds of a fickle faith because we all have some fatal flaws. It's so easy to maintain a religious veneer 
and yet be living for the things of the world, isn't it? Do you know what it is that could trip you up? That could cause you to falter or wander? Is there a sin that you seem especially vulnerable to? Are you messing around with anything this morning? Are you trying to serve two masters? Decide today whom you are going to serve so that you don't end up like Demas. None of us should want to end up like Demas. The life of Demas reminds us of our need to be on guard and to stay accountable. Last, we want to consider the forgiven. There are two on this list. First, we have Onesimus. The man with the sinful past. Look at verse 9. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. For, for a more complete understanding of this man with the sinful past, I encourage you to read the book of Philemon. Onesimus was from the city of Colossae and, and was a runaway slave. Somehow he had made his way to Rome where he had come in contact with Paul and was saved apparently. Even though he had been a believer for only a short period of time, Paul referred to him as a faithful and dear brother. Apparently he was another one that hung around with Paul and ministered to him while he was there in jail. Christ had forgiven Onesimus and Paul urged him to go back to his master who was Philemon and make things right with him. Philemon was a leader in the Colossian church. And so Paul made a beautiful appeal to him in, in Philemon verse 12. He said, I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. He's talking about Onesimus. Paul says that Onesimus was his very heart. And in Philemon 18, Paul offers to pay for anything that Onesimus had, had stolen from Philemon. And he wanted Philemon to not only forgive Onesimus, but to receive him back as a dear brother in Philemon 16. Onesimus, of course, was wrong for running away, but God forgave him, Paul forgave him, and we assume that Philemon did too. Onesimus, I think, it was a testimony to the power of God to transform a life. Finally, we have Mark, the man with the surprising future. The second friend who was forgiven was this, this man, Mark. Now, Mark was a cousin of Barnabas and was the writer of the Gospel of Mark. Mark's early track record was, was not very good with Paul. When Paul and Barnabas had launched on their first missionary journey, he took Mark along as an assistant, sort of an apprentice. And it's thought that when the going got tough, that Mark bailed on them and, and then returned home. So he basically deserted them. Later on, when Paul and Barnabas were getting ready to go on their second trip, Paul refused to take Mark with them. Barnabas wanted to bring him, but Paul said no. And that caused so much tension and so much disagreement between Paul and Barnabas that they decided to split up into two teams so that Barnabas could be with Mark, and then Paul took Silas along with him. Evidently later, Paul was able to extend grace and offer forgiveness to, to Mark. Paul didn't, didn't make Mark wallow in his failures or remind him of his mistakes. Mark's previous failures didn't disqualify him from future ministry. In fact, Paul trusted him implicitly and wanted Mark to be with him at the end of his life. In 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul is writing 2 Timothy just prior to his execution. He, he writes, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I love that. You see, the Apostle Paul had been wronged by Mark pretty severely. But Paul eventually forgave him to the point where they became the closest of friends and ministry partners. So there you have it. Paul's special teams players. Guys 
who were, were not ministry superstars. They are men whose spiritual exploits are not splattered all over the pages of Scripture. But these guys were, for the most part, faithful and servants of God. Few books have been written about these guys. I did find one on the internet when I was looking last night uh, about Epaphras. But uh, not, not too many, not too many books have been written about these guys. Epaphras obviously has, as I mentioned, you know, five different mentions in scripture. So he would be one that, I don't know, the guy wrote a book about almost 200 pages about Epaphras. So he's gotta be supposing a lot of stuff there because we're not told that much, obviously. But uh, here you go. These are guys that did the little things and God took note of their hearts and their commitment and their zeal. You know, we can all fit into that category, that same category. Being a beloved brother or sister, a faithful servant, a fellow minister. Open up your house. Be committed to pray. Be a faithful friend. Use your gifts and talents to bless the church which is his body. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. You do it as God calls you to. Hebrews 6.10, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. When I was a kid, there was a, a, a girl in the neighborhood who was what we called back then a tomboy. One day I was teasing her and made her mad. And she was one, I found out, that you didn't want to make mad. She started chasing me. There was an orchard behind her house, uh, and I was there in the vicinity of her house there. And she started chasing me through this orchard. And I ran through the orchard as fast as I could. My best friend's house was just on the other side of the orchard, and it had a, about a you know, four and a half foot tall fence there, block wall. And literally, I mean, I was running as fast as I could and I was kind of a chubby little kid and I didn't run fast. <laughs> I was kind of like Fat Albert, you know? No, 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 don't like to run. <laughs> but this girl was chasing me and she was gonna beat me up if she got a hold of me. So I ran as I could and I literally leaped over that fence. It, was, it would have been a great uh, clip, you know, for the Olympics or something. I leaped over the fence. Uh, I, I don't think I touched, I don't think my body touched the fence. But when I came over on the other side, I fell flat on my back. And it knocked the wind out of me. Unfortunately, there was no one there to help me up. And so I laid there for, I don't know how long, several seconds at least, maybe a minute or two, unable to catch my breath uh, thinking that I was suffocating. How about you? Are you knocked flat this morning? Do you feel like somebody knocked the wind out of your sails? Are you just laying around in life and ministry as if the wind has been knocked out of you? You know, you don't have to stay that way. It doesn't matter what your background is or, or what sin you've committed. Maybe you've run away from something like Onesimus. Maybe, maybe you've let someone down like Mark did. If you ask for forgiveness, you can have it. The Christian life is a series of new beginnings. You are not disqualified permanently because of what you've done. Failure happens. It happens to all of us. But failure need not be final. You can surrender your life to, to Christ today and he will forgive you for all of your past and it is forgiven and it's as if forgotten. God doesn't forget anything but he treats us as if he forgets it that's a beautiful thing if you've strayed away you can come back to Christ if you want to you can serve as a forgiven friend because God is the God of the second chance I hope you believe I hope you see this bighorn Calvary as a place where you don't have to be perfect, where, where you can come, the church really, 
and this is, this is not an exaggeration, this is, this is the absolute truth. This church, as well as the church that I pastor, and all the other churches in this community, and everywhere else for that matter, this church is, is just a, a, a building full of forgiven sinners and a hospital for the hurting, hopefully. There are no exceptions to this in the room today, no exceptions. That's what we are, we're forgiven sinners if we've accepted Christ as our Savior and Lord. This also challenges me to make sure that I'm not holding somebody hostage um, to something they've done or said in the past. I need to set them free and be willing to give them grace and encouragement like Paul did with Barnabas and with Mark. And, and just like God has done with me, God has forgiven me so much. If I told you about my past, you'd all be sitting on the end of your seats probably. But you'd say, how can God use a guy like that? Because he's God. He doesn't need me to be perfect. He can make me what he wants me to be. And he can do the same for you too. God may be willing or maybe, maybe asking you, just as Barnabas was graceful towards Mark, and Paul eventually became graceful towards Mark, God may be asking you to be a Barnabas or a Paul to somebody today. Do you know anybody that needs a second chance or a third chance or a 77th chance? Are you willing to come alongside and help a teammate get back on his feet, back into the game? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us today. I pray, Lord, that you would really speak to our hearts right now and that you would have your way in our lives. Lord, we want to be part of the team that you are calling in this world. We want to be those faithful ministers, those faithful servants. We want to be those who extend grace. We want to be those, Lord, who talk well of others, commending them, not tearing them down. We want to be your hands and your feet in this community. I pray that you will fill us with your spirit right now and that you will help us to be that. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.